Hi there. Uh, I'm Andrew Henderson, audience growth producer with the Lexington Herald Leader. And today I'm joined by Emily Bingham, the author of My Old Kentucky Home, The Astonishing, the Astonishing Life and Reckoning of the Iconic American Song. Uh, Emily, thank you so much for joining me here today. Glad to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, so this book, uh, My Old Kentucky Home, focuses largely on of course, the, the namesake, uh, Kentucky's state song, My Old Kentucky Home, and also uh, a little bit on the life of its uh, songwriter and composer, Stephen Foster. Um, you know, uh, Emily, first, before we get into sort of the, the finer details that you laid out here in your book, as it pertains to the history of the song and, and things of that nature, I was hoping if you could just speak a little bit about to you know, why you decided to, to pursue this to begin with, you know, why write this book and sort of what that meant for you. Sure. Um, so I am a Kentuckian. I was born in Louisville in the mid 1960s. And I came back to Kentucky after a certain amount of education, including a PhD in history in the 90s. Um, and as an adult, um, starting my own family, I, you know, I'd grown up with my old Kentucky home as a child, of course, and Derby and all the excitement that came with that and loving horses and the whole nine yards. Right. But, um, but it really wasn't until I was an adult that, uh, and, and beginning to go to the Derby sometimes myself and even have some friends come visit from out of town where I was kind of teaching them about, the things that happened here at that time of year that it, I started, I asked myself, well, what is that song that we sing and that I feel emotional about and very attached to, and, you know, that's part of my identity. Um, and in the course of a quick kind of check into when it was written and who wrote it. And I mean, that those very fundamental facts, I learned it didn't take more than a moment to see that this was a song about slavery. And looking at the original lyrics, it was written in the 1850s by a man named Stephen Foster, who I, you know, recognized that name, but I really hadn't known that he wrote that song and that he also wrote all these other songs I knew, like Oh Susanna and Camp Town Races. So um, I'd learned those songs like in music class as a kid. So th that was like, okay, he's famous. Um, but this song is incredibly sad and incredibly tragic and, and brutal because it tells the story of someone being sold from their home in Kentucky, sold, you know, right, um, to the deep south, never to see their family again. So learning that, I, you know, I sort of gulped. Um, and you know, it just sat with me over the years. I'm a historian. Um, I've written other books about things that just uh, kind of are swept under the rug in, in history. And I think this uh, falls into that category. I'm really interested in, in how we make sense of the world and the past. And so my question going into this project ultimately was how did a song about, about slavery become a, an anthem that we sing in these excited, you know, unifying celebratory moments at sporting events and, you know, graduations and uh, political, you know, occasions and, and such. And that's what led me to down this long road um, into the history of America's culture and its music. Right, and, and from reading from reading this book, uh, you know, a couple of couple of the early chapters, you know, focus on, of course, like who Stephen Foster was, uh, and I, I found it so very interesting that, you know, as he was beginning this career of songwriting, um, something that you know didn't really pay a lot of money, something that his family was kind of like, you know, you need to bring in money to support the family. Um, is that, you know, up until maybe the, the 20th century, long after his death, there was a really concerted effort made by numerous different people to kind of 
to kind of like revive who he was as a person because a lot of it uh, from reading this book is kind of obscured. Uh, there's not a lot that tells us about, you know, who Stephen Foster was personally or specifically. A lot of it we rely on from uh, things from other family members or brothers and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of gets me to the to this question of um, how is it that this that this song, My Old Kentucky Home, which you know, Stephen Foster had, you know, first written and then revised as something mm -hmm. based off of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, he writes, you know, Uncle Tom, good night. And then over time, he sort of like edits that to my old Kentucky home. Um, and it sort of sees that it, it sort of, from my reading, it seems as though he edits that because he was in this place where he was writing these songs for minstrel shows. Um, but he so desperately wanted to write something that was more sort of like elevated, like this parlor music. Um, and I, I think from reading and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that sort of leads him to make these edits to that first draft and result in my old Kentucky home. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, thank you for, highlighting, you know, this is really important when we are thinking about history to acknowledge that we don't have all the facts we would like to have to tell the fullest story. And that's absolutely the case with Foster, who didn't leave us any diaries. Most of his letters were burned by his family um, or thrown away. Um, so it's very difficult to get inside his head, right? Um, and what his exact intentions were. So part of my book does begin with the origin of the songs, song as, you know, his authorship of it, right? And the, uh, the context in which he was writing, which was mostly his successful songs were staged by blackface minstrels performing white men dressed up in blackface as black women and black men playing music, dancing and doing these sort of skits, which was super popular at the time. So part of the, you know, part of the book starts there, but then I also am going into sort of how the song courses through American history after that. But back to Foster, um, you know, you touch on that he had there, we it was discovered in the 1930s. So he dies in the 1860s, but it's discovered many years later after this sort of efforts of revival in the course of sort of, I don't know, round two or three of that, that, um, that he had written this draft uh, that was revised. And in that draft, it's called Old Uncle Tom Goodnight. And many listeners will have heard of Uncle Tom's Cabin, the incredibly famous uh, abolitionist or anti-slavery novel by Harriet Beecher Stowe um, from the 1850s. And, and the timing of this song's publication, you know, lines up with that perfectly. In, in revising his own work, which all, you know, all composers and songwriters do, um, he, ex he, he, somebody, he, uh, you know, extracted Uncle Tom out of there. And, the, the story of the song still does kind of conjure this, the, the no, Uncle Tom in Uncle Tom's Cabin was enslaved in Kentucky and he was sold downriver where he dies on the, uh, in, the, in the cane fields of Louisiana at the hands of a brutal overseer. Um, and that is pretty much the story of my old Kentucky home. But why would he take Uncle Tom out is I think, you know, one of your, your questions. And, and what I, you know, putting things together, and this is, you know, I can't prove this, you know, beyond, you know, without any doubt, but that he, he was hoping to not, um, he wanted to ride the Uncle Tom, you know, train, because it was popular, and a lot of people were paying attention. On the other hand, he didn't want to look too anti-slavery. And because that might also alienate a lot of people, and we're talking people in the North as well as the South, right? That's really important here. Blackface minstrel shows and pro-slavery, you know, was not just a Southern, you know, those were not Southern things only at all, 
there were lots of plenty of pro-slavery people um, in the North. And in fact, his own family was um, certainly not abolitionist in any way, shape or form. So it's while the song does um, have roots in that that story of tragedy and horror that Harriet Beecher Stowe produced, it is hard to, um, I can't, I believe you can't make a, a convincing argument that it is, uh, that it's, its impetus was purely anti-slavery in any way. And in fact, one of the things that was very revealing to me is that actual, you know, ab abolitionists who were active in the movement um, did not like that song ultimately because they found it wasn't very useful in motivating um, people because it, it did paint this portrait in the first verse of happy slavery times on a Kentucky plantation or farm. Um, everything is fine. The sun, and this is the verse that we know, right? The sun is shining, the birds are singing, everyone's rolling around on the cabin floor. Um, uh, you know, nobody's have, having to work hard. Um, and, you know, the only problem is this kind of vague event, which forces a separation. Well, it's not vague. 80,000 people were sold by white people. 80,000 black people were sold by white people from Kentucky. And that's a very concrete and heavy fact. Yeah. And, you know, to go off a little bit of what you said here, I, I couldn't help but feel from reading it that, like, with the writing of this song, Foster was sort of like, sort of like sitting on a fence, hedging his bets, almost, um, with like, you, you do, he doesn't create something that is so overtly pro-slavery, but he doesn't create something that is so, you know, explicitly anti-slavery either. Um, you know, I believe uh, a segment of the book that st stood out to me is that when he uh, when he gets married, uh, when he marries his wife, uh, Jane McDowell, um, and there's some, you know, sort of ambiguity, you know, like you said, there's a, a lot that can't be proven just because of the lack of, you know, hard first person sources and things like that. Um, but it's like he gets married, he could sort of vows like he's not going to do you know, these, uh, these songs for minstrel shows or things like that. But he's sort of, you know, like his debts are piling up, he's falling on hard times. So he sort of goes back to the songs that were working for him and starts pushing those out again. You know, my old Kentucky home being one of them. Um, and, you know, I think what really, what I found really interesting throughout the, the entirety of the book is how this song, My Old Kentucky Home, was sort of so versatile and by that I mean a lot of different people were able to utilize it in a lot of different ways um you know I I think uh to the section of the book where it's like the turn of the 20th century in Kentucky state officials are like using this song to promote business and tourism in Kentucky uh you know they're like yeah, you know, it's like this song portrays this the state in such a wonderful way, like, you know, come here and do business, come live here. Um, and then you also have some, um, you know, Black artists and performers at the time who tried to give their own spin on the song uh, to sort of develop it more into a, into a very explicit sort of liberation, uh, you know, anti-slavery, Black liberation anthem of sorts. Um, and, you know, I think my question in that is like, how is it that this song could come to mean so many different things for so many, like such a wide variety of people? Is it just because it, it's like so, amb like am the ambiguity around, you know, who Foster was or like the lyrics themselves, but, but you know, like how, how could it come to mean so much for so many different people? I like that question, um, Andrew. I think that's great. Uh, and it's so true. And I guess I would ask you and anyone listening to think about any, I mean, let's think about, uh, you know, a Beatles song, you know, uh, uh, it's getting better all the time or wh whatever, you know, just, so, any, any, you know, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club, Heart Club's band. I mean, um, 
and how it can mean something very personal, right? Or it can be used in a jingle uh, to sell something. Um, it can mean, you know, something that like I might play it for my child, right? Because I love that song. And then it has an association that's personal and full of, you know, something that's affectionate or it can have associations that are, um, uh, that are negative for some, like something happens while that song is playing and you carry that, uh, or it's the favorite song of your high school enemy or something, you know, or you were really unhappy at a time when it was the hit, you know, on the radio and you heard it. And so songs, music is one of the most powerful um, forms of human, you know, communication, right? And it's deeper than language. It's, it's, it, and so I do think that any song that is in the public realm, the way this has been for so long, is going to have just unbelievably wide meanings and even wide political, politicized meanings, as you referred to um, in, you know, in, in your question. So, you know, there's a great, you know, example of, you know, most, you know, most black people were not so fond of minstrelsy because it ridiculed and stereotyped them so brutally. Right. On the other hand, um, you know, if you you had this song that was incredibly popular among, you know, for all the reasons, it's also a powerful song. I mean, it's a Stephen Foster knew how to write a melody. Right. We got to give him some credit here uh, for that. And so, you know, you might use that song or try to use that song in a way that would reach your audience, that, that would, you know, help your career, perhaps but also um, maybe make it your own. And there's a great example of that in the book of a, uh, an actor, a woman named Henrietta Vinton Davis. I call her like the, the, the Beyonce of the 19th century. She was taking lemons and making lemonade um, with a song that had been sort of, you know, used a lot of not just minstrels, but then black um, Black performers in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s had been sort of, I won't say forced, but if you were going to be on stage at that time, you usually you had white managers and the stages were controlled by white people. And so a lot of those old minstrel songs were continued to be sort of part of the required repertoire. So a lot of Black people have been kind of forced to sing a song that was comforting. And the other thing is it's about home right? Home, everybody has a sense of home. So I don't want to forget that note. So anyway, this popular song had been sung by black people for white people for by the turn of the century for, for 50 years, right? But Henrietta Vinton Davis takes it and tries to find a totally new way of using it and making it empowering, right? And she's not the only example, but she turns the, the old Kentucky home into a place that uh, a, 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 a married black couple that have both played an incredible, you know, fantastic role in the civil war itself, come back to that plantation in Kentucky and, and buy it from their former owners and set up their Kentucky home. So it's actually called our old Kentucky home, this play. Um, so that's just an example of yes, how it gets taken and used. Um, and yeah, if you want to talk about at some, you know, some point, I think it's really in, really important um, because it is our state song. And this really is a, a book that I write as a Kentuckian with sort of, you know, as a letter of love, maybe with some tears in my eyes to my fellow uh, Kentuckians, though it's also a national story. But we, we you know, you mentioned those, um, those sort of leaders, politicians, business folks in the turn of the century who start using the song uh, to sort of promote Kentucky, right? Um, that is something that took firm, concrete root exactly a hundred years ago, this July 4th, when Stephen Foster's uh, uh, birthday actually is July 4th, and they opened in Bardstown, Kentucky, the old Kentucky home um, tourist attraction, uh, which is now called My Old Kentucky Home State Park. But mm -hmm. that was opened on July for July 4th, tw uh, 1923. 
And soon after that, the state uh, adopted it as its state anthem, right? Um, and so this kind of branding of of Kentucky using the song is something that I go into a lot. And I, I think it's, you know, one of the things that is left as an open question for consideration um, after knowing more of the history of this, of this song, whether that is the brand that Kentucky really wants for another century. Um, does that send an inclusive message um, and a welcoming message about who we are? And, you know, I, I think going off of, you know, my old Kentucky home state park um, and, and sort of tying it in, like you have, you know, you lay out in your book the, the sort of the works done by some of these, you know, some some of these black performance and artists of the time, like like Henrietta Davis, who tries to give their own sort of spin on it, their own sort of like branding of it, even. Um, but but we see over time that those those don't stick, you know, like people aren't lining up for those performances necessarily. They're, they're not, you know, sort of willing to entertain that perhaps like this song is not what is not what they thought it meant after all these years. Um, and then, you know, after, after many long years of like several, you know, sort of like key players and figures of like lobbying state officials or, you know, trying to work the history, you know, we, we end up with my old Kentucky home state park uh, and specifically, you know, the, the centerpiece there of uh, Federal Hill, um, which is a, a former plantation home uh, owned, owned by a uh, US, uh, U.S. Senator John Rowan. Um, and a lot of work is done trying to connect Stephen Foster with this home and, <laughs> right. and and I say a lot of work is done because as as you lay out in your book like you know first of all Stephen Foster was you know he's from Pittsburgh uh Pittsburgh Pennsylvania and the times that he would have been in Kentucky the times that were that could have been verified were maybe stepping off of a boat into Louisville um and so a, a lot of work and effort seems to be done to form a connection that says Stephen Foster was here at this home when he wrote this song. Right. And a, as you kind of lay out in your book, that's just not, that's just not the case. There does yeah. not seem to be a lot of supporting evidence uh, to back up that claim. Um, but uh, I feel as though once that now with that claim established it just becomes sort of the the de facto truth of the matter um <laughs> and you know oh why is the why is it that you think it was you know so important for you know was it just a solely business perspective like kentucky wanted to have a claim to this song or like you know certain people really wanted to like elevate foster uh to something more than he was uh, you know, but why is it that you that you think that endures? Because I think you know, probably a, a good number of folks out there do, in fact, believe that you know he was there, he wrote the song there, uh, when in fact that there's just not a lot of you know things to support that. You know, mm -hmm. why why is it that you think that that is something that still so strongly endures? Uh, again, like uh, almost a century later. Mm -hmm. Like we're right there at a century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what was the advertising uh, founder of the of, of the sort of realm of you know advertising? Who said you you say it and you say it and you say it again and you say it again and you say it again? But yeah, this is um, a problem. It's very awkward that uh, but but I think it started. You know, my you know here's the way I see it and the way I tell the story. Um, Kentucky in the turn of the century looked like a rough place. Um, a rough place to live, a rough place to do business, and a rough place even maybe to visit. And that was not a good look. We're talking um, about, you know, feuding in the Appalachian Mountains. The Hatfields and the McCoys were like national news all the time. Lots of stereotyping of mountain people and 
all their violence and so forth. And then you have a, a, a governor just elected who's you know, murdered on the steps of the Capitol in 1900. You have uh, farmers torching each other's barns in uh, Western Kentucky around this turn of the century time when the song starts being used as a symbol. Um, so I, I think what it seemed like the song was soothing, the song was um, sort of uh, sentimental and the song was about slavery. And so it cast a sort of more genteel, like, oh, plantations, genteel look for Kentucky than mountain people or even pioneers, which had been another kind of major sort of way Kentucky told its story to the world. Like we pioneered, we came west of the Appalachians. We, you know, came to this beautiful land. That was Daniel Boone, you know, that, that angle. Um, so I think that telling a story about the old South uh, was a, uh, set a different, set, it brought up a set of images that at the turn of the century, because we are talking about a period of Jim Crow and white reunification, that this, there was a little bit of this sort of idealizing again of, um, of the old days. So the problem when it came to finding a place to represent my old Kentucky home um, that would work, it was the only, the only home mentioned in the song was a, a cabin for enslaved people. You roll around, you know, these are the little young enslaved children born into slavery rolling around on the cabin floor, all merry and happy and bright. That's in the first verse. Um, so on the other hand, you could read that as if you, you know, don't, if you take out, we haven't said that there is a racial slur through the original lyrics of the song, you know, it, making it very clear we're talking about black people, not just white people. But anyway, today rolling around little cabin floor might seem, you know, unracialized, but it was then. Um, so, but that was the only home. So there was this family in Bardstown that had this big house and they had been sort of hmm, spreading word through the the media of the time, which was newspapers, that this house was called the old Kentucky home because Stephen Foster had visited there and written the song there. I'm not sure when they started saying that he'd written the song there. It kept getting embroidered. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, there were people who just saw that this song was known around the world and wherever Kentuckians went, they would be asked, oh yeah, that song, you know? So the more traveled and well, you know, powerful Kentuckians began to put together that this could make sense. And there was a grain of truth about a connection between Foster's family and that house. So I, what probably happened is, you know, the details of that connection might have been kind of even lost on the owners of the house by 1900 and 1920 when this started getting cooked up. But the, the fact was that his much older sister did visit the family there in the 1830s. And she even had a sort of a, a flirtation with one of the members of that family who seemed to be interested in her, but it didn't go anywhere. Um, so they did know each other in that time. Foster was a tiny child. He wasn't writing songs. Um, but, you know, and it's possible that he did hear about Kentucky, you know, through his family because of some of those connections. But it was, um, he did not go there in 1852 and or three and write this song. That didn't happen. And, and, and the straining to make that, um, that, literal connection, um, biographical stopover. I mean, the family even said that he was a great protege of the senator and that he, you know, spent most of his time there is, is the kind of inauthentic authenticity that is, you know, sold to us as history, right, left and center. But it has some really serious consequences because we're telling ourselves lies and that it, you know, it doesn't, really, um, when it doesn't hold up uh, to, to basic factual scrutiny, 
we are trying, it shows the strain uh, that you're, I think you're referring to of what we, we want something to be more authentic than, than we can make it. And that's not really a comfortable or sustainable long-term position. Even, and, you know, even though, as you say, many people will, will believe it. And even when they tried to kind of reform that in the seventies and say, actually, you know, that's not really what happened. Both the people, you know, running the place and the visitors were like, what are you talking about? He was here. <laughs> we don't like this sort of nuanced, maybe his sister was here and maybe he heard about it. Like, so what do you, what does, you know, what do you do with a site that is so, has such an accretion of, um, of storytelling that isn't, isn't authentic, is not historically valid, uh, and yet has found its way into our mythology. I think this is part of what makes you know, this song so, so interesting as a cultural artifact because it touches on all these sensitive points in how we decide who we are and what stories we tell about ourselves. Right. And, you know, I think a lot of that, you know, uh, over, over time, you know, and in the case of my old Kentucky home state park, you know, uh, a century, like you have this, you have these stories and these myths that eventually morph into, you know, tradition. Um, and I think that's what, especially here in Kentucky, my old Kentucky home has come to mean for a lot of Kentuckians is that it's a tradition or, or there's this thought that like, you know, like I, I, I think about the, se uh, the section in the book where it talks about like uh, people thinking, oh, they've always sung this song at Churchill Downs on Derby Day. Uh, when in fact that was another very well concerted effort by people to to implement that in there, um, and you know thinking about like you know this uh, uh, through the theme of tradition, and uh, I think this is the the last thing I want to ask you here today, just being conscious of the time that we have. Um, you know what what do we as as Kentuckians or even as like you know uh, people you, you know writ large like how should we approach you know this this song this tradition because you know i think you know ine inevitably you'll have you know people say like oh you know it was so long ago like it doesn't mean anything like you know like it's just a nice song um but then you know there's never a lot of like more thorough consideration as to what that song actually is or what it actually means uh, so, you know, how do we approach, you know, this song as as it sort of stands today as this large sort of behemoth of tradition, uh, both in Kentucky as its state song and also like uh, something that a lot of people point to as like Stephen Foster being a very well regarded, uh, uh, you know, American composer of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to the state song, and since our audience is largely, I assume, people who are also citizens of our commonwealth, I think it is really important to recognize that the song and the site and the derby uh, and playing it at games over many, many years, like UK basketball games, it's an absolute tradition to be played every single uh, single time, right? Um, that 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 it was it was called the uh, that my old Kentucky home when it was open was called the happy home of slavery. That uh, the song was called uh, a song that told of a happy home that could never be destroyed. And when you think of the homes and the lives that were destroyed for real. I referred to that earlier, 80,000 people, that is the size of Bowling Green. Um, if you were enslaved in Kentucky at that time when the song was written, you had one in two chance of losing a parent or a child to that trade. And if you didn't lose them, the, the possibility that it would happen was just ever present. That was never, you were never sure. Um, I don't, and I can tell you that many black citizens of our state have 
even after the lyrics were changed, which we should refer, we should mention in the beginning in the 70s, early 70s, and then into the later 80s, um, the slur in the word that made it clear that this was about black people um, was removed and substituted with people, just people instead of the, what I call the D word. Um, so, so there are, even after those changes were made, which was important and had been asked for for generations by that point, please take that ugly word out that's offensive to our part of our population. Even after that, Muhammad Ali never sang this song. Um, Dorian Hairston, who teaches in U uh, Lexington Public Schools as an uh, English teacher and is also a poet, said to me, what would it be like if my state song reflected my existence as a human being and not someone who was owned? Because every time he hears it, he, he is cast back into um, this part of history that isn't celebratory, that isn't, there's nothing to celebrate about. Right. If we were getting together and singing My Old Kentucky Home to ponder our weighty um, history and that that was going to you know, be what we want to focus on at basketball games and derbies and so forth, uh, or even in the halls of our, our legislatures, that would be one thing. But I don't think that's what a state song is asking. You know, that's not what we ask a state song to do. So I do think it is time to hit a hard pause and rethink. As a, as a community, I do, um, whether this is the song that can make us truly feel like celebrating. And we want to celebrate our state. There's so much to celebrate and there's so much unifying that we can do. And I think this may be, uh, you know, not the best way. And then on a more, you know, high, whatever, a broader level, Andrew, I do think, for me, the process of uncovering this complex, all these stories we tell, um, Eleanor Roosevelt used to say, study history realistically, you'll love your country just as much. And I do believe we can be clear eyed and patriotic. Like there is no, to me, conflict between those two. Um, but it did teach me how, um, even little things that we do so unconsciously, completely unintentionally can be very hurtful. And once we know that they are hurtful, it, it makes no sense to me that we would want to, uh, tradition, I understand that, but once we know that it's hurtful, why would we insist on holding to a tradition? And, and, and that, that's the question I guess I would, I would want you know, us to take time to think about, and there's, this isn't the only example of that in our country or our system. Um, and so to me, in a way, this is a bit of a, uh, just a symbol or a, uh, a microcosm, right, of larger questions that I think we're called to, to ponder about the kind of society we all want to have and how we might get there. Well, Emily, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of ground this book covers that we, uh, you know, didn't get into. Uh, well, one of my personal favorites is the the popularity of the song in Japan, uh, as well as as well as the uh, prevalence of uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants over there. Uh, it, truly, you know, one other thing that to take away from this book is that this this song, "My Old Kentucky Home." especially in the, the, 20, the, the 20th century, really spread so much further outside the borders of Kentucky uh, to a point that uh, I, I certainly didn't, didn't know or really didn't anticipate myself. Um, so that's just what, about one of the many tidbits uh, of history here in this book. Um, but thank you, Emily, so much. Um, uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, again, uh, I'm Andrew Henderson with the Lexington Herald Leader, uh, joined by Emily Bingham, author of My Old Kentucky Home. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.